All right, good morning. Well, we're in uh, this series on how to walk in the Spirit, and we're looking at uh, the, we did the introduction, and then uh, um, believe that God's grace is for you is what we did uh, last week, and this week we want to look at receiving God's grace for you personally, and then uh, at the close of the study we'll, we'll be receiving communion. The, um, um, uh, the study last week, we, we brought up some examples in the Old Testament of people that had uh, really entered into that grace. They believed the grace of God was there for them, starting with Noah and so on, um, Abraham. But one of them was Rahab, and uh, just the grace of God that was given to her and that she received and she entered into. And... Uh, Quite an extreme example, I think she is there for a reason, and to uh, just to give us that awareness of uh, God's reaching out to that person with the greatest need at any one particular time, and so we just used that as a we gave several, of them, but she was one of the examples. And uh, afterwards, uh, Roger from the body Ramos came up to me, and I'm just so blessed. He's uh, a real encourager in the in the, the Word of God and and in the relationship with the Lord and what He sees. And He came up and He said, "Man, did you see that in there? You know, because AI they go in and, and and here's all the stuff and they took it. And He said, "What are you doing taking that stuff? You know, and give it all back. And those that took it, you're dead. You know, you're dead to me. Because what had happened was AI and Jericho were so bad, their idolatry. I think of Pompeii." And what we know is, you know, uh, ins uh, inscribed on the walls and on, on the grounds and the artwork and everything else, it was all debauchery. And uh, Canaan was like that, and beginning with Jericho and Ai. So God was just saying, just stop everything right there completely. He says, but look at Jericho. And I, I just did the study and talked about it. I'm going, yeah, I thought I just did that. <laughs> and he, he says, no. He should realize God went in and destroyed the whole city to take out one person, one family. He went there, he sent them, sent them to the right place on that wall, on the corner, to a woman who God knew feared him, even though she was trapped in her profession, obviously, because her actions... Uh, compared to her profession, and where her heart was at was completely different. And she said, no, I fear God. God went in there, and, he, and he's going like this, and he goes, and then for one person, he took down the city. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, that is exciting <laughs> when you think about what he will do to reach someone who's trapped in their unbelief. In other words, they're trapped in that, a city of unbelief. But their heart is yearning for the truth. Ah, oh, thank you. But their heart is yearning for the truth and uh, uh, wanting to know that truth, what he goes through, what he does to reach that person. And you think about your own life before you came to Christ and the people God brought in there that you brushed aside the people that you insulted or didn't listen to or, or made fun of or whatever, and God just kept coming into your city, <laughs> you know, just for one person, one person. So when you hear that statement, Christ would have died just for you if you were the only one, that's an example. Here's a person that's just their life is in shambles in that sense, and yet she had a heart for the Lord. She wanted out of the circumstance she was in. And the moment she saw it, she said, please, you know, I'll protect you. Just hide here and everything else and remember me. They said, oh, we will. And of course, the blessing of it is then she uh, becomes a part of Israel and she marries into Israel, into the tribe of Judah. And from there, the uh, child of God Jesus Christ comes through that lineage, through Judah, through Rahab, 
the harlot. I always wondered how that works. You know, you have a testimony, and you think, I'm kind of embarrassed about my testimony. But it, the way she was titled, I can just imagine, uh, imagine the father saying, aren't you, uh, yeah, you're, you're Rahab, the, the harlot. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'd like you to meet my son. <laughs> I mean, it just seems like, but the concept was, you're the one that saved Israel. In other words, your testimony, when you think I'm kind of ashamed of my testimony, but because of your testimony, how many people, because of your life in Christ, have been touched by Jesus Christ? How many people has God touched because you were changed? And so by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, you overcome the devil. She's such an example of so many things, and I just love Roger's enthusiasm about it, though, because I hadn't thought in terms of, yeah, the whole city. Well, take it out. Get her. <laughs> don't worry about anything else. Get her. And that's the way the Lord is with you. And if you don't know the Lord right now, whatever he's moving in your life to get you here, to get you to listen to this, that's just part of his plan because he loves you so much and he'll move mountains to save you. Well, receiving God's grace is where we're at from that place now of... Uh, Believing God's grace is for you, that it's personal, in other words. Okay, so now, assuming you have the study last week and, and, uh, and you're aware of that, you know, that God's grace is there, that's one thing, that's what was the introduction, but now that grace is for you, very personal, that's something you can, you can receive. Well, in receiving it, how important, is it really something biblically that, uh, that God is presenting to you? How do you receive it? How do you enter into that? In uh, John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He's the way, he's the truth, and the life. So Christ's grace, which is Jesus Christ on the cross dying for us, God providing his salvation through us, his sacrifice, in other words, as the way, the truth, and the life, the first part of it is that you know that you can't come to God except through that grace. Because Jesus is the very uh, evidence of the grace of God to come and die for us. And then in Mark 1.8, he says, I have baptized you with water. This is John the Baptist speaking. And he says, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's the means of God's grace. Jesus Christ dying for you is the evidence of his grace. The means of his grace, how does he impart that to you, is by his Spirit. The point of that is it's not by works. It's not something you can work for to get the benefits of God. It's totally by grace. And the process of receiving that grace, first of all, believing it's there, believing it's for you, the evidence is Christ, and the way to receive it is by his spirit. And you can't come to the Father except through the Son, but how do you do that? He says, when he went to heaven, he says, I will send my spirit. Because they're a trinity, they're all, it's God. But he sends his spirit to dwell with us, in us. That's the receiving aspect of the grace of God in our lives. So to follow up on that, in 1 John 1, verse 3 and 4, he says, That which we have seen and we, have, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things that our joy may be complete. And uh, in some translations, that your joy, and it's because the word can, is, is about, it's inclusive. It's your joy, my joy, our joy. And so it's all the, the same concept in what, uh, uh, how it's presented. But he wants us to know these things. Why? So that we will have fellowship with him. When we have fellowship with Christ, we have the joy of the Lord. So he writes these things so we'll know that. Well, how do you have fellowship with Christ? By his spirit. 
It's not by a picture of him. It's not by working for him. It's not by doing something to get something from him. It's by his spirit we receive Christ and we know the Father. And it creates a fellowship with us. We are body, soul, and spirit. He is a trinity. We have fellowship with him. We're in his image, but it comes by his spirit. His grace, therefore, is by his spirit. And he says, if uh, in John 14, he says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So we tend to take that uh, and just separate it from everything else and say, I want a new car. I want a boat. <laughs> I want to do this. I want to go here. I want to do that. And there are many times that, you know, God just provides and does whatever you're asking for. And there are other times when it's like, no, his answer is, no, not now. Wait a minute. If I ask, you'll give it to me. There's a place for asking and prayer and doing God's will. That's true. But this is his point, the context of what he's saying. He says, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And the, the, Jesus says, basic, you love one another and you love God with all your heart and soul and mind. He says, you fulfilled the commandments. In other words, you're not going to lie. You're not going to steal. You're not going to take your neighbor's wife. You're not going to be covet, you know, covetousness, all this. this. So keep the commandments. He says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Jesus being the helper, he will give you another one to come alongside you. And that's the Spirit. And he will be with you forever. Now that little addition is huge. Because he says, I'm sending the Spirit to be with you, the helper. And forever means when you get to heaven too. Forever and ever. You'll always have this relationship with the Spirit, which brings you to Christ, which brings you to fellowship with the Father. So it's not going to be like you get saved and then the Spirit's over there and the Father's over there and the Son's on the throne and everything else. The Spirit is always going to be a part of your life from the moment you get saved for all eternity. Now you might have had friends that have left you or walked out on you or family members or whatever. Some people that are extremely important to you or have been. You know, What's going on? Why have they left? Or they died and passed on and you, you feel like, you know, they've left me. Never the case with the Spirit of God. The moment you give your life to Christ, his spirit begins that, prop to, uh, that, that, that place of immersing you in his spirit, baptizing you, immersing you in his spirit, and he will be a part of your life, which is eternal forever and ever and ever. He will never, ever leave you. So you think, well, I don't need to worry about the spirit. It's not worrying about the spirit. Or I don't know about the theology of baptism and speaking in tongues. and All that is an aside. It's to know him, to have fellowship. It's not to glorify the Spirit, but it's through the Spirit you know Christ. You really begin to know him. You begin to really understand the Word, and you have fellowship with the Father, which is the purpose for God sending his Son. And it comes by the Spirit, and he'll be with you forever. Verse 17, and even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, the world doesn't see the Spirit. You say, well, I don't see the Spirit either. When you're saved, you start looking at everything. You realize, that didn't evolve. Are you kidding me? You see the uniqueness and the power and the authority of God just even in a single cell. And in the beauty of a sunset and a sunrise and in people's lives and, and love and peace and joy, things that you can't see, but you see the Spirit in that working uh, really in the midst of the world and things going on. You can see the Spirit working in ways that, that the world just cannot comprehend. And uh, just a story was shared with me this morning uh, of a pastor in Mississippi, right? Mississippi. Uh, and they're, they're going someplace, and they park the car, and they just uh, went a short distance. But in Mississippi, you know, you can carry a weapon. Uh, you can have a weapon in your glove box or carry it concealed or have it on the back of your truck or whatever, you know. Anyway, they, they walked away just for a minute, but the three-year-old son uh, found the gun, and uh, the parents heard a shot, and they went back there, and he was dying. 
and uh, they were finally able to get, the, there no phone cell service in the area they were at. They finally ran down to find somebody they knew was a medic and he wasn't home and going around, finally get somebody to get, get a hold of the, the ambulance and the police and they get there and they, they knew the child wanted to always grow up to be a sheriff. So they, they took the badge off and put it in his hand and they, they, they talked to him and then the family got around and prayed for him and got him in the ambulance and, and he passed away before he got to the uh, uh, before he got to the hospital. And the pastor and his wife, of course, were just uh, fraught with anxiety and, and all of that. But they said, Lord, you're, you know, something to this effect. Lord, your spirit is with us. You know that uh, uh, what was going to happen and you know about all these things. So uh, I want this to be used for your glory. And just the letters that poured in of comfort for them. They had already planned a revival uh, that they were working on. In fact, that's what they were doing that day. And uh, so they said, no, we're going to go on with the revival. And of course, that became part of the testimony and the evidence of the love of Christ and the, the real issue of life, whether, it's, whether you die when you're three from a sad accident or you live till you're 103 and you just stop breathing. My dad used to say, everybody dies from one thing, lack of breath. <laughs> and he's, you, all of a sudden, you just stop breathing. What, regardless of the time period, do you know Jesus Christ? And we know that child is with the Lord. The world doesn't see that. They don't see mercy. They don't see grace. They don't see love. They don't see those things that even in the most difficult of times where God can intervene in a family and put his loving arms around them and, says, and say, you know, as God ministers to them, I know what it's like to lose your child. But there's a purpose. And they went out to the revival and preached the gospel. The world doesn't understand that. The, um, it says, the spirit that you know him for, he dwells with you, John 16, 8. And he will be in you. And of course, in Acts chapter 1, he shall be upon you. And... Uh, uh, he, in John 16, 8, it says, you'll convict the, uh, the Spirit comes to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. Uh, so when he's with you, he's convicting you of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. But when you've repented, you've humbled yourself, and you've given your life to the Lord, then the Spirit comes in you. And he's a part of your life, and he'll never leave you. He's, he'll always be with you forever. Because when we're born, because of Adam and Eve, remember he said, if, if you take a bite of the knowledge of good and evil, you lose your innocence, you're going to die. Well, their spirit died that day. And the only way to revive that spirit is by a sacrifice. And God sacrificed an animal, put the clothes on them, said, now get out of the garden. Everything's changed. But you need to have the sacrifice once a year is where they got to eventually through uh, uh, Moses, Abraham, and so on to where they had a, more of a, 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 a continual thing to, for the sacrifice. Why? So once a year, they would be renewed in their spirit because their spirit was dead. You shall die. And uh, the wages of sin is death. And then the prophecy that there would come one, though, that would r die for our sins that's what all the sacrifices were kind of escrowed for. They were kind of pointing towards it, in other words. That he would be the complete Lamb of God, the salvation, and raised from the dead, and then he would send his spirit to become one with our spirit. That's why he talks about marriage being a type of the gospel of Christ in Ephesians 5. It's the very mystery of the gospel, that the two become one. That in that relationship, what you have is the spirit then becomes a part of our life, and our spirit comes alive. And we become part of the family of God. We are then a child of God. He calls us, in fact, his bride. In, um, so he's with you and he shall be in you. And this is all a work of God's grace given from God to the Son. The Son gives the Spirit. And the Spirit is how we receive the grace. In verse 9, And I tell you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. 
For what, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will it, <clears throat> for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? So your kid says, hey, can I have some fried fish tonight? Oh, sure. Here, close your eyes. Take a bite and put the snake on his plate, you know? No. He says, or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, he's talking to me? <laughs> yeah, he's talking to us. He says, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? All these, just ask, just seek, and we, we tend to think that that's all about material things. And there are times when, yeah, you need to keep saying, Lord, but this is, I really, you know, this is what I want. I need the, the manna from heaven. I need, I said, I'll give you a quail. I'll give it until it comes out your nostrils. Those things aren't really as important as this. He says, no, what this is about, ask, seek, and knock, and he'll give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask. That's heavy, isn't it? He's with you. You get saved, he's in you. But if you ask for the Holy Spirit in the end of Luke, he says, he will come upon you. In Acts chapter 1, he quotes that. The Spirit of God will come upon you. So he's with you. He's with you. Convict of sin and righteous judgment to come. He comes in you when you're saved. And then he comes upon you if you ask. It's like rain from heaven. It's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So you say, well, I don't want any of that stuff. I'm speaking in tongues. I don't want any of that. Some do, some don't. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is to be fully immersed in the Spirit of God. He's with you, he's in you, and then he wants to now empower you. That's a different aspect. And he says, in that, be renewed in the Spirit daily. I don't know of many days, honestly, where I haven't prayed, God, fill me with your Spirit. I want God's power. I don't want mine. Mine's nothing. It's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. It's that relationship with God where God does stuff speaks to us, gives us words of knowledge or direction or, or just the, the very work of God for the grace of God to give somebody something that they need at a moment that they need it. We have to go out of our way to do it, but it gives you the power to. There are those that have been raised in a church or a denomination or a structure that you have such a fear of God that you really, you don't talk to him. In fact, maybe you're so afraid of him, you talk to his mother instead, or to the mother of Jesus. God wants you to be in fellowship with him. And the way to do that is through the grace that he gave through his son, which is imparted to us by his spirit. So all of the theology, in a sense, aside, it's God, save my soul. Thank you for being a part of my life. I know I will be with you. You will be with me forever. Now empower me to do your will that I might declare the powerful, wonderful works of God. And however you do that, I'm fine with. Just empower me, Lord. But you don't, you say, well, I don't have what this person has. Ask. Ask for that. Ask for that dunamis, that power that comes with the word where we get the word dynamite. It's what it is, is the word for power. Not just authority, but it's the power of God in your life. In uh, James 4, 6, it says, uh, He gives more grace, therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pastor Nathan did this study, and uh, he's doing a study in James on Wednesday. And if you missed it, I encourage you to get it because he goes into depth in this whole portion of Scripture, the next three or four verses. It's all about how you humble yourself. Uh, the, the, the primary activity with the Lord to receive from God is not kind of, well, I've been good this week and I've done this and that. And so, you know, God, you kind of owe me. So now I'm going to come to the doors of the throne of God and I'm going to ask you. That's not humility. <laughs> You know, my righteousness is filthy rags in his sight. It's just, God, I got nothing to offer you but myself. Here I am. What do you want to do? Humility is not putting anything of you between you and him. 
Nothing of you, only Christ. Put Christ between you and the Father, and the Spirit will fill you, empower you, and direct you. But it's an act of humility. And it's the very first thing, I believe, that begins the process of salvation. Because before Christ, there's such a pride and an arrogance in all of us that we think we don't need God. Now, we might even, I didn't, but you might have gone to church and everything else, and that just made you feel more proud. But it's when you just go, I got nothing to offer God, and now I realize my sin. I realize I've broken the commandments of God. I've done this, I've done that. I've been an idolater, whatever it is. And you just go, God, I got nothing to offer you but my soul. Forgive me. That's humility. That's where salvation begins. And then you're, you're, the Spirit comes in you, and all of a sudden, whoa, the light comes on. You see things, right? You see things differently. You look at the world differently. Everything about it is different to you because you now have your spirit is alive in God by his spirit. Humble yourself. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that grace comes by his spirit. That's how we receive it. Then he said to them, there, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. This is in Luke chapter 24. There, then he opened their minds to understand the scripture and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Repentance, without repentance, there's no remission of sin. If you say, okay, God, I want to know you, and there's no place for repentance in the process, whether it's at that moment or the next sentence or the next day, but someplace in there, repentance, where you go, wow, man, I'm, I, who am I to judge anybody? Where you repent. The repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be uh, proclaimed in his name to all nations, all peoples, in other words, Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. Not with you, we already know that. Not in you, because he's already stated that. But now I'm sending them, because he's talking to those like Peter where he says, the, the Spirit was, he breathed on him the Holy Spirit, so he had the Spirit in him. He says, now to come upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Evidence of God's grace through his spirit by knowing him, by conviction of sin, because he convicts of sin, we don't. That's not, you know, our place. We, we can lay out the word, uh, we can pray for him, but it's the spirit that ultimately convicts. And when that happens and there's repentance, there's conversion, the spirit comes within and then there's that place when asked for, the Spirit comes upon power to live the Christian life. If you're a Christian right now and you think, I, I don't know, I just, I come to church and I read the Bible, and, but I, I'm just still so intimidated to even hand somebody a track and, or, to, or they talk about the, the end of the world and things going on and I know the scriptures, but I'm, I'm so timid and I, I just can't seem to share my faith. It's like you got a new car and you're pushing it everywhere. <laughs> and somebody says, huh, you know, I, I knew you a couple of years ago. And when you've changed. Yeah, I'm a Christian now. Oh, really? It seems like a lot of work. Because you haven't filled the tank. <laughs> when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, all you got to do is step on the pedal. God will do the rest. He's already provided the means to make it happen. But you need to ask. Now, how does that apply to us in relationship to our Savior in fellowship with Christ? Well, it really all comes down to what we're going to do today is communion. We, we have the emblems of communion to remind us of what he's done, but the fellowship with him in communion is something that is a part of our life every day as we just open our hearts and our minds to what he wants us to do and what he wants us to be because he's with us. He doesn't leave us. In um, 
Philippians chapter 2. It really expresses all of this. You have the foundation in James of humility and other places, but here we have the example bound up in where our humility should be. So, if, which of course opens the door for the spirit of grace in our life to receive, right? So, um, so this is the means, the means, the avenue of God's grace through Christ by his spirit. He says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit. So if we're participating with what the spirit is doing, this is how it unfolds. Any affection and sympathy. Complete my joy. Remember what it says in 1 John. This is, I write this to you so that your joy be full, right? Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Okay, so what does that mean, to be of one mind? One, you know, we, don't, we all function differently. We all have different personalities. But it's like a football team. They can all be different people, and you've got quarterbacks and linemen and <laughs> everything else. But what's the, you all have the same goal. You work as a team to get the ball from one end of the field to the other. I love Vince Lombardi. He would get uh, uh, pros, people, you know, first is the, the Vikings. And it didn't matter if they'd played football all their life or they, they got out of college and they just got on the team and now they're, the, they're in the NFL. And he'd line them up and the first day of practice, he'd hold up the football and he'd go, gentlemen, this is a football. <laughs> this is what it's about to get it from that part of the field, the goalpost, to that part. And I'm going to show you how to do it. <laughs> all of one mind. And that's the point. This is the gospel. We all have the same mind concerning that, how to get from that place where you first got saved to the end goal to reach others for Christ. And so he says that we have the same mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But, and here it comes again, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Really? Yeah. Now what would that do for you? That would mean if you see somebody on the side of the street pushing a cart, they're sober, but they're poor. They're collecting bottles, they're trying to make a living, you know, best they can. And instead of looking down on them, having the same mind that Christ would have, how do you reach them for Christ? Or how do you help them or bless them in some way? How do you treat them as you would want to be treated? Because you don't know how they got there. You don't know what brought them to that place or how they were raised or beaten or, or you know, what their DNA is. You don't know anything about them if you don't talk to them. Now, you know, if they're on drugs and they're drunk, it's you, you're casting your pearls before swine. But if they're sober and they're, you know, they're in that kind of situation, I can remember when uh, uh, I got saved and we just started our life over again and everything else and always done fairly well and had nice cars and just, you know, not uh, you know, super rich or anything, just having a good life more often than not and things going fine. Uh, but all of a sudden flat broke and... Uh, trying to sort things out, and I had an opportunity to go to work for a restaurant that I used to manage, one of the chains, the Spires restaurants, what it is. And uh, uh, John Heratakis was the owner, and I spoke to him about some stuff, and he said, hey, you want to work? You know, you own your own restaurant. I said, yeah. So I went to work for him, and um, uh, later on, I had a job with something else, I, I moved on to something else, and then God pulled, literally just stopped that. And I went back to Spires working for a friend of mine in construction. And I was pulling a toilet off the wall, and I had to clean everything out and doing all of this. And somebody came in and said, hey, are that you, Gary? And I said, yeah. And he says, you used to manage this place. What are you doing cleaning the toilet? 
And I, I said, well, that's my job right now. I got to do that before I can fix the rest of this thing. And, um, and I thought, yeah, Lord, what am I doing? <laughs> and it was pretty straightforward. The Lord said, because if you don't understand what it's like to be in this position, you're going to preach the gospel as if you're doing them a favor because of what you're giving them comes from you and, and you got your act together and they don't. Unless you realize you're the janitor. And I've been the owner of a company and president of corporations and other things. But he took me there first and said, don't you ever lose that. And I'll never forget when I worked for Joe Gottwald, multi, multi-millionaire, president of, uh, of a uh, title company that I worked for. And I told the story before. He says, I don't feel good. He says, uh, uh, would you pray for me? And I said, yeah. And I, I walked over his huge desk to go. He got up from the desk, walked around, got on his knees, and just waited for this young man that worked for him as a salesman. But he knew I was a believer, and, and I walked with God. And uh, he just got on his knees and waited, and I prayed for him. And I, I walked away thinking, wow, that's, that was a humble spirit. He called me about an hour later, and he said, boy, thank you very much. Praise God. He says... I've never had that happen before in my life, but I am totally healed. I'm going to an appointment to you know, meet with these people. And thank you. And I said, yeah, you're welcome. Oh. <laughs> you know, But I realized he understood what it meant, that he didn't look down on me or any less you know, uh, because I was a young salesman and he owned the company. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, that is part of the spirit of humility I think he's talking about there. Uh, counting others more significant than yourself at any given time, in other words. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, have the mind of Christ, not ours. When we look at it, we think, oh, I can't believe that person's doing that. And where do you think you'd be without the grace of God? Well, that's different. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Let each of you look out not only for the, his own interest, but the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which was in, is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was, and speaking of Jesus, was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. In other words, he wouldn't hold on to that, but emptied himself by, making, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. We go, I shouldn't have to humble myself and go help that person or go do this or do that. You know, I, I've got more important things to do than talk to that homeless person. And here's God Almighty that becomes flesh and lives among us, even to the point of being the seed of a woman. I mean, he starts really just right to the nitty gritty of it all. And then humbles himself to the point of death when he's on the cross and he's dying and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Boy, didn't they? And neither do we. Here's God Almighty in the flesh humbled himself and we think, well, I shouldn't have to humble myself. You want the grace of God? He is the grace of God and he manifests himself through his spirit to us so that we can have the mind of Christ. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now think about this. The, the concept, he says, um, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. The sense usually is, is uh, 
presented to us or our concept of it is every knee is going to bow because he is king of kings and lord of lords, right? And he's coming in almighty wrath. He's God who said, I'm, I'm enough, and I, enough of this at the end of tribulation. And he will come as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And yet that's not the case of the bowing of the knee. Every knee eventually, if yours is already bowed because you've, you've received Christ as Savior, when you, when you humbled yourself and prayed, I don't care if you're driving in the car, in the airplane, or sitting on a couch, or on your knee, uh, the, 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 in your spirit, you're, you bowed your knee and you received Christ. That every unbeliever, everybody, their knee will bow, not because he stands before him as the lion of the tribe of Judah, but because he still has a spirit beer mark in his side and the nail prints in his hands and his feet. That God Almighty became flesh and died for them and they refused it. Or they accepted it. But either way, their knee, our knee, will bow. Not because he stands as the lion, but as the lamb who will take the scroll out of the hand of the Lord. That the the place of humility for Christ is the place that he gives us to humble ourselves, to receive the grace, the spirit, to glorify God, <clears throat> excuse me, to be empowered, to be able to minister to other people the truth that he's given us, that their knee could bow now rather than later because they will bow. Again, not because of his almighty power and authority, but because of his humility that they refused. It's pretty heavy, isn't it? So we're going to have communion just in remembrance of what he's done for each one of us. And you should have gotten one of these. If you didn't, would you raise your hand and we'll have... Chris, I believe, will bring one down to you, so please raise your hand if you didn't. Uh, and if you're with us at home, go ahead and get your, your bread and grape juice, whatever you're using there and peel the top back so you can get to the wafer. And if I can do this right, which I still haven't done. <laughs> it's in here somewhere, trust me. Everybody got it easier than I did. I don't have any nails on here. I don't know. Hard to grab. I'll have to take note of that next time. That's the way for you're supposed to get out of there. <laughs> uh, communion is about the fellowship with Christ. And the closest fellowship that we can have with Him is not simply in the wafer that we take but in the humility that we walk in. And there's a place of authority in humility. By that I mean that uh, Moses, in his own writings, said that he was the most humble man that ever walked the face of the earth. Now you've either got to be really prideful or extremely humble to be able to say that and not be arrogant. But it's because he had walked through a place of brokenness in fact, for Moses, he even was a place where he, he cried out. And he says, God, just kill me. I mean, he was ready for suicide. He was so broken. That when you have a, had that place in your life and you understand that you can always go back to it and realize, I don't deserve the healing that comes from the broken body of Christ. I don't deserve him dying on the cross for me. What I do receive is his love for me, his grace for me, his spirit for me simply because he's provided it, not because I deserve it. That we're saved by faith, by grace through faith, not of works, least anyone should boast. Can you imagine getting to heaven if it was about what we've done? Heaven would be hell. <laughs> I mean, you really have some braggarts up there, right? No, we're all going to know that we are totally there when we see his face. We are there by the grace of God. And the more we enter into that now, the more blessed we are on our journey. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for the broken body of Christ example to us here in this emblem because you, knowing that we need emblems, we need things uh, that remind us of your presence and your spirit and what you've done. So you said, take this, do this in remembrance of me because they took Passover on a regular basis and now that's been given over to the Gentiles too to know you are the Passover lamb. So Lord, for healing, touch lives right now and heal. That by your stripes, whether it's emotional, whether it's traumatic, whether it's depression, whether it's suicidal, uh, whether it's, it's just uh, tumultuous uh, uh, problems that are going on or physical by your stripes. Lord, we thank you. We remember your death until you return and we receive this by faith, receiving your work in our life, not presenting ours to you, but simply our faith, trusting in you. In Jesus' name, let's partake together. Father, you have given us in the fruit of the vine an example of the beginning of the the fruit for us, the first fruit coming from Jesus Christ by his shed blood, that he gave his life for us. And he did it as an act of sacrifice, but also born out of contrition, not contrition, but pure humility. To do that, to be one of us, and to forever, even as the Spirit will forever be with us, that Christ will forever be in that sacrificed body, a new body for heaven, certainly he ascended, but as he said, put your finger in my hands, in my side, see it's I, that you be like that forever and ever. For us to be reminded as we bow our knee what price you paid for us. And to anyone now, whether it's in the audience, whether it's here in the sanctuary that wants to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, maybe you've just gone to church and you don't really know him, you don't know that relationship with him through his spirit, pray with me right now. Father, forgive me for my sins. Come into my life. Save my soul. And fill me with your spirit according to your word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that even if I come to you now as a, as a believer from a long period of time, Lord, or just a few months, that I can bring my sins before you and know that when I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. In every aspect, Lord, we come to you with this purpose and this plan of knowing what you want to do so that we can have fellowship with you. And that's what we want, to know you, Father, through your Son, by the means of your Spirit, so that we might have the revelation of the knowledge of your will and your grace. In Jesus' name, let's partake together. Communion with Christ, with one another, we have the physical emblems. In the spirit, we have a, a brother and sister relationship. And in the spirit, we have a child relationship and the bride relationship with Christ and as the family of God with the Father. Uh, his love for us is beyond anything we can comprehend, that agape love, that while we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. He didn't say, as soon as you get your act together, I'll be there for you. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> no. When we were yet in our sins, and even those that have run away from the Lord and just thrown your life away as the prodigal did, the moment you said, oh, what have I done? Since the Father ran out to meet him. Our fellowship with the light with Christ is by the Spirit of God, His grace as we receive it, to really comprehend what's incomparable of that agape love that He's given to each one of us. Let's, let's stand.
You know, the um, the blessing of God in our life is that when we wake up in the morning and we haven't had a good sleep or we've had a difficult day before or we feel like we're just so far from God, it doesn't change who he is towards us. If you've had a great day and you've been in the word and you've prayed for people and people have, uh, have uh, been touched by your witness or you gave them a track or you just ministered in some way and everything was going, to f- going fine, he doesn't all of a sudden love you more. He can't love you any more than what he did on the cross, right? But what happens is when we understand that love by his spirit, then we can always come back in humility to receive that grace. And that makes the fellowship real. That makes it sweet. That means that you don't have to be some super saint and you don't have to run from your sin and hide it as if he, would, he doesn't know it. You can just at any moment, at any time, Father, I need your help. He says, wait a minute, you got about 10 things you got to check off here first. No. He says, what do you need? Well, first of all, I need your spirit. I need wisdom. And then, whatever it is. And he's just so ready to answer, to show you his love, to pour out his grace, and to fill you with his spirit. That's the very first thing John said. Is I baptize you in the water, in water, but there's one coming that's going to immerse you in his spirit. And then Luke says, all you got to do is ask. <laughs> so Lord, we ask. We believe and we receive with the same mind, with the same goal and the same intent. In Jesus' name, God bless you.